Do you really need a big rocket engine? Like, really? Let's say you're designing a rocket the size of a Saturn V. Well, or maybe a little bit smaller, but still big enough to safely carry a single person to space and back again. And you think you can do it with just a single rocket engine? Just like, stop for a second. There's so many things to consider from throttling, attitude and roll control, combustion and stability, costs and manufacturing that there's no one size fits all solution. So today let's dive deeper and talk about the pros and cons of smaller and larger rocket engines. Hello rocket fans and welcome back to the Copenhagen Suborbitals Rocket Shop where we continue working on the world's only crude crowdfunded space rocket Spica. And as mentioned in our last video where we introduced the BPM25 engine as our new rocket engine for the speaker rocket. In this video we will dive into all the pros and cons of switching from a BPM100 engine to a cluster of BPM25 engines. So Jakob, I think probably the biggest uh, challenge we were facing with the BPM100 that steered us towards this path was uh, manufacturability and long lead times for the BPM100, right? Yeah, that was the major issue. The design process was was fairly easy. Uh, the numbers come out fine. We know how to design it. We wanted this and this size, but how do we get how do we get the parts? So looking at the in-house uh, manufacturability, um, well, there is quite a difference between trying to make an engine of this diameter and one of this diameter. So that's the first part. We couldn't really do all the parts for the BPM100 in-house. That posed a significant number of challenges. That means external partners, that means uh, trying to get a lot of sponsor assistance for manufacturing these. It's, uh, it's large pieces of raw stock that go into these parts uh, that becomes more waste, that's more expensive. There is a, a number of things that just makes a BPM100 size engine very complicated. I mean, at this point, the, the BPM25, where we got to this point, has taken about half a year, including design time. So if you scale that up and we go for like a year and year and a half, maybe to build a, a BPM100 engine, you're right. If, uh, if something goes wrong, then we're, the, the setback is just a whole lot bigger. There's a much, bigger, much quicker turnaround time on this uh, device here. And that's mainly because we have sort of taken the manufacturability back in control. BPM25 fits within our production machinery we have in-house. We start from raw stock material, and then we can machine our way to these engines here. Um, we, are, we, we don't have that option if we are looking to BPM 20, uh, 100, unless we would have a grand sponsor that would support us with numerous new expensive CNC machines. And that's probably not happening. Yeah. And I guess one of the other things with big engines like a BPM 100 is, uh, the question of combustion instability. I don't know how much can we simulate that in software or on versus how much of that needs to just be ironed out on the test end, which again brings us back to the previous point. Well, the only way to test rocket engines for you, you can do a lot of simulation and there are many good tools around for doing that. But the only real way to test a rocket engine is to fire it up. And a lot of the experience comes from from doing that part, the operational testing of it as well. So, of course, there's a lot of num there's a lot of, of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you, I mean, we're already starting to have a lengthy discussion here between BPM 25 and BPM 100. But let's try and get through all these and then see if we can make the, make this complex picture a little more clear. Uh, because there's not one that's wrong and there's not one that's right. It's a, it's a trade-off between what do you want, what will you accept, uh, what do you have of resources, etc. Yeah. So we have a we have a lengthy list for you. So this will be the long, slow talk. Yeah. <laughs> and the other item is on the list is more of a maybe systemic look at the engine, how it fits into the whole uh, program and the rocket. And is that with a single engine, we can really have roll control. And that's where one of the pros of the BPM25 also come in. I mean, the BPM100 engine, from a, again, from a systemic risk point, is a possibly a, a pretty sensible idea. Uh, a rocket engine can suffer from a number of abnormalities. And if you have one engine, you have a multiplier of one. 
if you have five engines in a cluster suddenly, well, there are five engines that can potentially suffer the same mistake, so or the same fault. So there is a risk part in this. So to some extent, uh, it's quite arguably uh, sound that, that running with a cluster of engines just carries a higher risk with it. But, but you're right also about the role control. It does make quite a huge difference. Um, with How the, were we planning to do role control on speaker? Well, versions? that would require yeah, a cold gas uh, system on the speaker rocket with the old engine. Uh, because even with a two-axis gimbal, sure, we can steer the rocket exactly where we want it, but it might decide to start spinning around itself and one engine won't, won't have any means to counteract that. If we have BPM 25 engines, well, we can basically just order two of them to work in opposite directions on a single axis gimbal instead of a two axis gimbal. And we can basically have both attitude and roll control as long as we're powered on that one. Yeah. So to some extent, the, the gimbal system becomes simpler because we just need one axis to swing. Um, the jury is still out whether or not we want to go with a full uh, two-axis gimbal on the center engine. It might prove to have other advantages, which we will also get to in the pros and cons discussion. Yeah, and this also leads maybe to some of the reusability of the software for the BPM25 configuration on the speaker. The thrust vector control on a four-cluster engine or a five-cluster engine is a lot more similar to what we've done on the Nexo 2 rocket, since you don't have a secondary control system in terms of uh, cold gas thrusters that you need to account for, right? I mean, in, in essence, actually, the core part of the guidance system will remain exactly the same. The navigation and the control part will stay the same. The, uh, the actuation system will just have a number of alternative inputs. I mean, we will have a larger number of single axis gimbals to control, uh, but then no RCS thrusters uh, in, uh, as on, on the positive side. So it's it's actually not it's not overly complicated shifting from this particular one engine to a multi cluster engine configuration, at least from the control point of view. That's when we're discussing attitude and roll. Then there is this discussion on the flow control and the thrust uh, control of the engines. That comes in as a, as a, as a separate part in the discussion. And uh, I mean, it does carry a risk because obviously if we, the pipework for a BPM 100 engine would be fairly simple. It's one set of main valves and one set of pipework and you're done. Then we get into the discussion, how do we want to do this on, the, uh, on a five axis, for example? Uh, well, if we can get the performance of all the engines similar enough, that can be done with uh, some static tweaking. We have some possibilities of affecting the flow just a little bit up and down so that we can hopefully get exactly the same thrust of, out of the engines under the same operating conditions. And that's, of course, part of the hot fire test running of each engine. You characterize how does it behave exactly so that you can model and balance out all the thrust uh, issues. So if we, can, if we can get away with some extra pipe work, but stay with perhaps just one set of main valves, uh, starting and stopping all engines in one go, well, that's the simplest way to do it. If we can get away with that, because there is also a little bit about, um, about throttling, that is a discussion here. On the BPM 100, we have only one option, which is to, to, to reduce the, uh, the propellant flow that will lower the combustion chamber pressure that will bring the injector closer to becoming unstable or starting to, to have some, some feedback into the, uh, to the propellant system. So you're walking a fine line there. Um, if you have uh, more main valves in a pipe work for a cluster set of engines, you can decide if you want to suddenly when the rocket becomes very light on the late part of the flight, maybe you'll just want to shut down two outboard engines if you're running a five cluster. Then you'll still have roll control from the one axis gimbal on the two outboard engines and you will have attitude control from if you have a, a double axis gimbal on the center engine. So that won't risk, um, I mean, then three engines would be running at their peak efficiency. You wouldn't be throttling down the chamber pressure, getting in, into, into the border region where the engines might start um, 
start start uh, having combustion instabilities. And then there is also the uh, like management. However, we have to to handle the management of hot gases. I mean, they'll be spewing out a lot, and there will be. Uh, I mean, if there is a if there is a vortex from some of the hot gas coming back, then hot gas from one engine might affect uh, the number one, the one next to it. Um, that is a, a known issue that we will have to take a good, careful look at as well. Yeah, and all these challenges of managing flow control, I don't know, instability, throttleability, these are things that will need to be part of the qualification campaign on the engine before we even put it on a rocket and fly it. So what are the some of the maybe disadvantages or uh, advantages of the BPM25 versus BPM100 in the test case, test scenario? Well, the test campaign becomes more extensive. Um, we have to put for um, for the initial parts, for example, for just characterizing each BPM25 engine, we have to put five engines up and down in the test rig and, and, and test that. Um, so that is, of course, a, a disadvantage in this. Uh, furthermore, I mean, you would just put up a BPM 100 engine, fire it, test it, characterize it, and then you could bolt it onto the uh, to the rocket frame. But we have to bolt all of these individual engines onto a cluster frame, and then we'll have to do a, a, a test and qualification again, and then take the entire cluster, put it up in the test stand, and then wiggle all the axes uh, and measure out all the uh, thrust uh, components, all the thrust uh, um vectors that, that is coming out of that gimbaled uh, engine system. So yes, there is more work uh, on that part. Yeah, but I guess at least at, when we want to qualify the design of the engine, uh, when we're just testing first prototype single units, uh, we can do it faster, cheaper, iterate quicker with the BPM25. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for starters, this engine is one that you can still carry around. Um, that's not gonna. That was not gonna happen with a BPM 100. So um, you hold this engine in place and you bolt it onto the scaffold in the test container, and you can do your testing. Um, so we have to do that several times, but at least it's manage manageable, like physically. Yeah, and at the same time, when we were uh, still designing the BPM 100 engine, we were already trying to get ahead of ourselves to start building its test equipment and test infrastructure. So will that be able to be reused for the BPM25? We, we took a special approach on the, uh, on the BPM100 test stand we have there. It's, it's probably going to keep that name, actually. Uh, but it was, first of all, initially, we've been doing one small engine test stand before. Then we got to the, like, the realization, OK, we can't really, we can't push it much beyond the 5 kN on the small test stand. It doesn't have the, uh, the capacity for it. All right, so we don't make test stands very often, so we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't be uh, shy on the specifications for the next test stand. So the BPM 100 test stand is actually capable of handling structurally quite a bit more than a hundred kilonewton engine because we don't want to make a new test stand every time we scale up. And very big test stands function perfectly with small engines. So it can handle small engines like these ones for qualification. It can handle clusters. And if we get really ambitious and get a new CNC machine park someday, well, mm -hmm. maybe we can take uh, even bigger engines as well. It's just a matter of uh, adjusting the tank size uh, in the test hand, I guess. Yeah, well, don't, uh, don't be shy again. So the uh, BPM 100 test stand out there can take two full-size flight tanks from the speaker rocket. So it's a, essentially do a, a full burn if we need to. Unfortunately, it's going to require a huge amount of pressurization gas for those 1200 liter tanks if we're just going to test something like this. So since the uh, tank section structure of that test stand is, is, uh, is mobile or dynamic, we just put in a, a, a propellant test frame with uh, some 300, 400 liter tanks that are coming about soon enough. In essence, maybe when we come back to the conclusion of it, maybe the BPM25 was actually just a smarter solution for us. I mean, the capabilities we have, the budget we have, the uh, machining possibilities, and 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 the whole gist of it. Um, so we 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 pursued the BPM 100 for for quite a while. It it's one solution that would be a really really good one for the speaker rocket. Problem is, we just it was 
it was too much of a challenge to make it a good and efficient process. So taking a step back, complicating on some parts of it, for example, pipe work and clustering, but suddenly we are back in control. Now we can do these when we want to, how we want to. We can go test them. We don't have to fight with uh, export control and dual use items and stuff like this. This can be handled and machined locally. It just makes more sense for us to go with a uh, clustered solution to bring back the momentum and, and keep things up to speed uh, and, and continue our development forward. Um, both will work. Uh, both will get a very, very big rocket into the air. Um, it's just a matter of, of, sure, of, of sort of, I guess, choosing the path of least resistance. Right now, it looks like it's the BPM-25. Yeah. So in the future, we'll be releasing more videos on the manufacturing process uh, that uh, went into machining these engines and finally welding these engines to make a final test ready piece. And uh, of course, if you want to see us build more than one of these engines, uh, we'll need probably four more for the cluster. Uh, you can support us by going over to www.copsub.com where you can become a monthly supporter for as li little as a coffee a month. You can also check out our merch shops in the description below and we'll see you in the next video.